I'm really relieved to hear the reaction. We've been trying to get Michael Moore, so I'm glad you're satisfied with our speaker. <laughs> Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Paul George. I'm director of Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. And I welcome you here on this very special occasion in what is a very special year for the Peace and Justice Center. This is our 20th anniversary of being the Peninsula's leading grassroots organization. So welcome to the birthday party. This will kick off our, our celebrations. Mark Twain once wrote, Truth is our most precious commodity. Let us conserve it. <laughs> the political leadership in Washington, when it comes to truth, that seems to be the only conservation program they have in mind. <laughs> but I guarantee you we will have no such conservation this evening. In this so-called war year that George Bush has declared, it is so important that we have access to the information that is so consistently concealed from us, misinformed, disinformed. That's why we're so glad to have Noam Chomsky here with us this evening. I'm so glad to see so many people here. I know people came from all over the place. It's been wonderful to see. We have a lot of students here tonight. That's been great. I've seen the young people come out for Noam Chomsky. I really don't know what to say to introduce a man who's already so well known to you. So I'm going to get out of the way and please ask you to give a very warm welcome to what, what I think is one of this country's most important natural resources, Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Check first to make sure you can hear me. Yes? Louder? Yeah. How's that? Any better? Okay, I'll try to remember to stay close to the mic, and if I lean back, uh, wave at me. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've uh, been in the thousands of talks I give all over the place. Uh, I've found myself uh, kind of reluctantly giving talks about uh, endangered species, uh, meaning by that things like uh, democracy, uh, human rights, uh, socioeconomic development, uh, others. Uh, but the prime one, uh, unfortunately, is uh, human beings, ourselves. Uh, I think there's a very serious threat to survival. Uh, it's not a joke. Uh, it's following from, it's uh, as a consequence of policies that have uh, a great deal of uh, elite support, uh, a lot of popular opposition, overwhelming popular opposition, but more ominously, they're rational policies. That is rational within a framework of uh, ideological and uh, um, socioeconomic institutions uh, that exist and are pretty stable. And within that framework, uh, policies leading almost inexorably to self-destruction, do appear rational and are being pursued. Uh, I want to talk about some of these. These are not going to be things that are, actually I've been giving quite a few talks here in the last couple of days in this area, and they've mostly been on topical matters, uh, but I want to turn to things that are maybe, in my view, more important. Uh, they do involve issues of survival, but are not on the front pages. They ought to be. Uh, however, first I will say a couple of words about things that are on the front pages. These concerns have been put to the side in the last several months uh, by, uh, uh, at least in public discussion, by the threat of international terrorism, uh, which uh, compels us to peer into the abyss of the future. That's a title. It's supposed to be careful about plagiarism these days, and that's plagiarism. Uh, I took it from a full-page headline uh, in the New York Times uh, about uh, September 11th. Well, uh, September 11th was undoubtedly a major atrocity, major terrorist atrocity, uh, 
uh, and it's been, it was regarded that way throughout the world, virtually without exception. Uh, however, uh, sometimes it is useful to uh, pay a little bit of attention to what people are saying outside the little cocoon of rich and privileged and powerful uh, people within which uh, most of us spend all our lives. Uh, me too. Uh, uh, and in fact, there were interesting things to say uh, outside of that uh, about international terrorism. Uh, it was, uh, so for example, in Central America uh, and uh, the Middle East, uh, which uh, have had uh, considerable experience with international terrorism, uh, described as uh, a plague spread by depraved opponents of civilization itself uh, in a return to barbarism, uh, in uh, the modern age, so on. I happen to be quoting uh, Secretary of State George Shultz. He was the moderate of the Reagan administration, some of you will remember. Uh, they came to uh, office 20 years ago uh, declaring that uh, the war against international terrorism was going to be the focus of U.S. foreign policy, uh, and uh, particularly they would concentrate on Central America and the Middle East which they described as the center of the operations of the depraved opponents of civilization itself. Well, uh, it's interesting that we haven't heard anything about this in the last six months uh, after the war on terrorism was redeclared on September 11th. It wasn't declared, it was the same war with the same rhetoric, actually even the same people if you look. Uh, probably it'll be carried out about the same way has been so far. Uh, but nothing has been said about this not very ancient history. Uh, although in places like the Central, Central America and the Middle East, they haven't forgotten it that quickly. Uh, the places where the war against terrorism was focused. Uh, in uh, Central America and the Middle East, they have memories. Like they have memories of the fact that the defenders of civilization uh, launched uh, terrorist campaigns of unprecedented scale and violence uh, in both areas, in Central America and the Middle East, which just overwhelmed uh, any other terrorism that might be taking place there by orders of magnitude. Uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, and, and this they do remember, undoubtedly. I just happened to return a couple of weeks ago from the site of one of the uh, more recent uh, international terrorist campaigns, uh, namely uh, southeastern Turkey, where there was a savage assault against the population beginning in the mid-80s, uh, pe peaking in the 1990s uh, during the Clinton years, some of the worst uh, atrocities and uh, ethnic cleansing of the 1990s, uh, far m worse than anything that Milosevic is being tried for connection with Kosovo. Uh, two or three million people uh, uh, made refugees, a couple of thousand towns and villages destroyed, uh, tens of thousands of people uh, uh, killed uh, Kurds, this Turkish campaign against the Kurds. Uh, every imaginable form of uh, torture and barbarism. It's all well reported in human rights reports and scholarly literature and so on, and of course they know all about it. Uh, it's international terrorism because we paid for it. Uh, it was all done with the military and economic and uh, uh, doctrinal support, uh, diplomatic support of the United States, uh, first by the Reagan-Bush administrations, but then peaking under Clinton. Uh, in fact, in the year 1997 alone, uh, Turkey, that single year, Turkey received uh, more U.S. military aid than in the entire period from the beginning of the Cold War up till the onset of the counterinsurgency campaign in the mid-'80s combined. Now, it's that absolutely nothing to do with the Cold War. It's just straight, outright international terrorism, uh, organized, uh, paid for, uh, supported, encouraged in Washington. Uh, and uh, uh, primarily by Clinton, he ended up providing 80% of the arms, uh, and uh, t Turkey, in fact, became the leading recipient of U.S. Uh, arms outside of Israel and Egypt uh, by the end of the 1990s. By 1999, it was replaced by Colombia, 
as the leader, and that's the focus of the next major uh, war against terror, which will be very much like the earlier ones. You can be sure of that, and they don't doubt it. Well, the uh, repression of the Kurds had been far worse than anything uh, bad as Kosovo might have been. It was far worse than anything reported there and remains so uh, right up until the present moment. Uh, it's a kind of dungeon for millions of people now. Uh, you may have read in the papers today or heard on NPR as I did driving somewhere uh, that for the first time uh, Afghans were able to celebrate the Persian New Year. Great celebration about that, and it's a good thing. Uh, not for the reasons they talked about, but you know we can be happy that they did that. Uh, in uh, uh, the same celebration takes place in Kurdish areas, in all the sort of Kurdish Persian areas everywhere, except southeastern Turkey, where it was banned by the Turkish government. A couple of people killed. Big demonstrations. Uh, the uh, United States is now ascending Turkey to fight the war on terror in Afghanistan uh, in gratitude for their achievements of the 1990s in uh, conducting some of the worst terrorist atrocities of those years. Uh, and in fact, that is uh, regarded as a model. So if you read State Department reports or the front page of the New York Times, uh, articles by their terrorism experts, they laud Turkey for having shown, a, for having demonstrated uh, how one should deal with terrorism uh, and serve as a model for the future, and therefore they're the ones who should take responsibility for uh, fighting the war on terror in Afghanistan. Uh, this is quite a tribute to the uh, uh, servility, I guess is the right word, of the uh, educated classes in the West. All of this passes without notice, Virtually none of it was reported, still isn't reported. Uh, beyond just suppressing the fact, uh, they are even lauded for the achievement of conducting some of the worst uh, international terrorism of the last few years uh, and uh, 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 serving now as a model to how to conduct the war against terror. Well, there's nothing here surprises anyone in Central America or the Middle East, or in fact most of the world because they're quite familiar with how wars against uh, terror are, uh, uh, are carried out. Uh, all of this simply illustrates what ought to be a complete truism. Uh, terrorism has a definition. It means, uh, it refers to the terrorism that others carry out against us. Uh, if we carry out against them at a thousand times the level, that's not terrorism. Uh, and furthermore, it's not, that's in the United States, that's universal. You can try hard to find an exception to it in the scholarly literature or journalism or everything else. But it's not just the United States. As far as I know, it's universal. I think it's a historical universal. I can't find an incident in modern or past history when that hasn't been true. Uh, so if you take the worst, you know, the worst mass murderers who existed, say the Nazis, in occupied Europe, take a look at their propaganda, uh, they were defending the population uh, against the terrorism of the resistance, which was directed and supported from abroad, and defending the legitimate governments like Vichy against these terrorists. And like all propaganda, there's a certain element of truth to it. Uh, nobody doubted that the partisans were being directed and supported from uh, London and Washington. That was perfectly open and they undoubtedly carried out terrorist acts. If you can think of a resistance movement in history that didn't, I'd like to hear about it. It's not to say that it's a good thing, but it's just a fact. Uh, and uh, so there was some truth to the Nazi propaganda that they were fighting a counter a war against terror, and uh, we can take pride in the fact that we're in good company. Uh, it's not all that different. Uh, and uh, as I say, if I don't know of any exceptions. I presume if we had uh, records from Attila the Hun, we'd probably find the same thing. Uh, if, you can, if anybody can think of an exception, I'd like to hear it. I'd add it as a footnote somewhere. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, uh, some, of, some of these things remain in memory, some don't, and pretty, they, follow the, they follow the principle. So for example, on March 11th, uh, there were solemn ceremonies around the country, very well reported, uh, commemorating the sixth, six month uh, anniversary of the 
atrocities of the World Trade Center uh, that was a serious terrorist attack. Undoubtedly, it's the first terrorist attack on, in the national, first military attack, first violent attack against the uh, national territory of the United States since uh, 1814 when the British burned down Washington. Uh, and every December 7th, and that's justified, you should commemorate that. On uh, every December 7th, we commemorate uh, an attack against uh, military bases in two U.S. colonies on 1941. Uh, and yes, that, those are terrorist atrocities or aggression as well. And uh, that makes sense. We should commemorate those crimes. Uh, there are others that pass without mention. For example, this month, uh, which happened March of 2002, happens to be the 40th anniversary of March 1962. Uh, that was the month in which the Kennedy administration publicly announced that it was sending the U.S. Air Force to uh, bomb South Vietnam uh, and initiate uh, chemical warfare to destroy food crops, uh, authorized napalm, uh, began the, officially began the project of driving uh, hundreds of thousands of people, it ended up being maybe 10 million people, uh, into concentration camps and slums, try to overcome indigenous resistance. Uh, that's 40 years this month, I haven't noticed any commemorations or any reference to it. And the reason is it's kind of like the atrocities in Southeast Turkey, it didn't happen. And it didn't happen because we did it. And since we did it, it's not a crime. In fact, it's not even part of history. Uh, and maybe, as far as I know, that, in fact, that one is even lauded as a noble cause and a noble achievement. Left uh, millions of, um, South Vietnam was the main target of the U.S. attack all the way through. Ended up practically destroyed uh, the rest of the Indochina along with it. Millions of corpses. Nobody knows within millions, literally, what the number of dead was. Uh, for, because of another principle, you don't investigate your own crimes. Uh, you investigate other people's crimes with you know, laser-like intensity, uh, but your own, since they don't exist, there's no need to investigate them, and we don't even know. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, among the general public, uh, information is so slight that the one study I know of that was done uh, to try to see what people thought, you know, so what, what's your guess as to how many Vietnamese victims there were? Uh, turns out the mean guess uh, is uh, 100,000. Uh, that's as if in Germany uh, now, if you ask people how many Jews were killed in the Holocaust, uh, and the mean guess was maybe 200,000. Uh, if that happened in Germany, we'd think there's a problem there, you know, some, if, if, that, if you got results like that. Uh, well, we don't think there's a problem here because uh, Germany was defeated and therefore they have to face the facts of what they did. But the United States has always been victorious, 100% of the time. And when you're always victorious, it's very bad for the character. Uh, and uh, part, of, part of the defect is you just don't pay attention to what you did to other people. Uh, so therefore you don't have to worry about how the first war on terror was waged or how this one's being waged or the fact that the one of the major, some of the major terrorist atrocities of just the last few years are in fact not only, you know, the, not only the atrocities overlooked, they're actually lauded as successes in counter-terror and the uh, agent of them is praised. Uh, sometimes it takes real effort to ignore these things. So you may have seen uh, a couple of days ago, I've got the clipping here, uh, March 11th, there was a front page story in the New York Times, probably the San Francisco Chronicle, uh, about uh, uh, big headlines as some see panic as main effect of dirty bombs. Uh, some Sci Federation of American Scientists discovered that uh, radioactive materials that are in quite wide use in the United States, uh, cobalt, radioactive cobalt rods that are used to irradiate uh, food and so on, can be turned, in principle at least, into what they call dirty bombs. They could be spread over cities, say New York. They say that would, uh, these would be weapons of terror that would probably kill few people, but would spread panic and produce se severe economic damage, uh, uh, would raise radiation levels above what's acceptable by the uh, 
EPA, Environment Protection, Environmental Protection Agency, and would undoubtedly cause panic. So that's a front page story, and it should be, indicates the kind of uh, uh, abyss that we should be peering into. Uh, uh, the couple of days before that, uh, three days before that, the wire services reported, it was barely, had a friend do a database church, barely search, barely noted in the press, but wire serv all the wire services reported a conference going on in Vietnam, uh, which had leading uh, U.S. specialists on uh, 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 public health, um, uh, mainly concerned with the effects of chemical warfare. Uh, this is not the possibility that some people, a few people, might suffer from a dirty bomb in the future, but rather the chemical warfare of the years uh, 19, of the 1960s, beginning in March 1962. The uh, leading U.S. specialist, a professor at the University of Texas, had been doing blood tests of dioxin levels uh, around South Vietnam. Uh, North Vietnam was spared this particular atrocity. It was just the South that had the chemical warfare attacks beginning 40, just 40 years ago. And he found uh, dioxin levels up to 200 times above average. That's one of the most severe carcinogens. Uh, there is some investigation of this by foreign journalists. Uh, one of the leading uh, Israeli reporters, uh, very well-known and respected reporter, Amnon Kapeliuk, uh, traveled through the region in 1988 and reported in Israel uh, that uh, uh, what he called uh, uh, hideous uh, uh, deformities among children, uh, dis deformed fetuses in the hospitals, you know, horrible uh, effects. He estimated at that time, 1988, about a quarter of a million victims. Uh, the, the public health specialist uh, uh, a couple of days ago uh, pointed out that there's still new victims, so it's something very lasting. Uh, but again, that's not a crime. It's not like the possibility that some people might be affected by dirty bombs by terrorists in the future. This is just, you know, who knows how many, maybe a quarter million people uh, affected by U.S. chemical warfare in South Vietnam, so therefore it isn't even worth mentioning. Actually, sometimes it is mentioned. About 10 years ago, there was an article in the New York Times in the science section by their Southeast Car Asia correspondent, Barbara Crosette, uh, who uh, pointed out that it's kind of a mistake for us not to investigate this question. Because, if we, because it's, a per it's a perfect experimental situation. We have two genetically identical populations, North and South Vietnam. So we have a control group and a test group. Uh, one of them was subjected to intensive U.S. chemical warfare, the other was not. And if we investigated it, we might learn something that would be useful for us. Uh, so therefore, we're kind of overlooking a real opportunity by not paying any uh, attention to this problem. Uh, the conception that maybe we ought to do something about it, like pay reparations or try to cure people or something, I mean, that is so remote from uh, it's just un unintelligible. The words don't mean anything. You can't say it in polite company. Uh, well, those two stories uh, differed in that one was a front page story and the other was unmentioned. And that again uh, illustrates uh, the principles. The principles are, you don't, I, we don't commit any crimes. It's kind of a logical impossibility. Uh, and uh, terrorism is what they do to us, not what we do to them. So therefore, it was unnecessary in the past six months to report anything about the history of terrorism. Uh, and if you look carefully, you'll find nothing. Nothing about the first war on terrorism, nothing about the fact that the same people who ran that one are running this one, uh, and nothing about the fact that the U.S. was condemned for international terrorism in Central America by the World Court, uh, would have been by the Security Council if it hadn't vetoed a resolution uh, calling on all states to observe international law. Uh, the current leader of the war on terrorism is the only state in the world that has the, uh, 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 that is, happens to be both uh, uh, condemned by the highest uh, international tribunal for international terrorism, but also happens to be the only state in the world that uh, has vetoed a Security Council resolution calling on states to observe international law. Its assistance in the uh, its, its coalition partners are leading terrorist states. 
Uh, Russia is delighted to join the war on terrorism to have authorization for its atrocities in Chechnya, same in China, same in Israel. Turkey stepped up repression. Uh, that's what I was there for uh, uh, and is now honored by taking over the role of uh, leading the war on terrorism in Afghanistan. Uh, all of this passes unnoticed, unmentioned. Uh, if you can find a word about it in the reams of paper that have poured out, uh, I'd be surprised. I haven't. Well, that's inside the cocoon. We happen to be rich, privileged, victorious, powerful. Uh, we don't have any responsibility to pay any attention to what's going on in the world. Well, outside the cocoon, you hear different voices. So in Yarbakir, where it was a couple of weeks ago in southeast Turkey, uh, where the celebrations were just uh, banned yesterday with uh, uh, troops and demonstrations and killings, uh, they do condemn the September 11th atrocities. Uh, but they also uh, remember very well their own suffering at our hands, uh, which vastly exceeds anything uh, that took place in September 11th, horrible as that was, and they still live under harsh military rule. Uh, that relies crucially on uh, U.S. support at every possible level. That means military support and also silence, which is major support for atrocities. Uh, in Central America, up and down the region, uh, the, uh, again, if you read the press, the uh, atrocities of September 11th were condemned, uh, but with, uh, with memories. So in Panama, for example, uh, one of the least affected countries, uh, the press condemned the September 11th bombings the way everybody else did, uh, atrocities the way everyone else did, but pointed out we're not unfamiliar with it. Uh, and they referred to um, Operation Just Cause, uh, George Bush the uh, first, who invaded Panama and uh, in one bombing raid uh, attacking a poor barrio, a slum, the barrio Churillo, according to the Panamanians, killed a couple of thousand people in one raid. Well, we don't know anything about that since, again, it's our crime, so you don't look at it. Uh, but the Panamanian estimates are approximately 3,000 people killed uh, in one bombing raid in Operation Just Cause, which was, uh, as you'll recall, an operation undertaken to uh, kidnap a kind of a minor thug uh, whose crime was disobedience, not, not criminality. It, carried out plenty of criminal acts. Uh, he was kidnapped, uh, brought to the United States after the U.S. vetoed two Security Council resolutions uh, and uh, carried out a few actions like the one I just described. He was tried, sentenced, he's now in jail, uh, for crimes that he committed while he was on the, US, the CIA payroll almost entirely. Uh, but that's, the Panamanians remember that, we don't. Uh, and they remember it when they condemn the crimes of September 11th. Uh, in uh, Nicaragua, the journal of the, uh, the research journal of the Jesuit University, which is the main research journal in Central America, uh, they uh, condemned the bombings and the atrocities of uh, the World Trade Center and Pentagon in, uh, of September 11th uh, as uh, Armageddon. They said it could be called Armageddon, but we too have uh, uh, remember our own excruciating Armageddon, which left tens of thousands of people dead, uh, devastated the country, may never recover, uh, sort of gone down far below ever since the U.S. took it over again in 1990. It's now the second poorest country in the hemisphere after Haiti, uh, which also remembers a number of things. For example, they remember that They've been the target of most U.S. intervention, military intervention in the 20th century and are now the poorest country in the hemisphere. Uh, they also remember that uh, right in the midst of all the furor about the unwillingness of the Taliban uh, to hand over uh, al uh, alleged criminals, suspected criminals, uh, and uh, uh, meaning that we have a right to bomb them because uh, they don't want to hand these people over to us, that we refuse to provide any evidence and uh, refuse to consider their offers of negotiation. Right wh while all this was going on, uh, Haiti renewed its request uh, for the extradition, a formal extradition, 
of a leading war criminal, uh, Emmanuel Constant, who's happily living in New York. Uh, he's, he was the head of the paramilitary forces that were responsible for killing maybe four or 5,000 people uh, in the 1990s. Uh, under a military junta, which was in fact supported by Bush number one and Clinton, uh, uh, and they've uh, sentenced him in absentia. There's no problem in this case about finding evidence or uh, uh, finding the perpetrator, uh, but the U.S. won't extradite him, uh, nor will the press even report it uh, because it's so insignificant, four or five thousand black people. Uh, the uh, Probably the reason why the U.S. refuses to extradite him, everyone presumes, uh, is that if he is brought to Haiti and tried in person, he'll spill the beans on his uh, CIA connections during the period of, in which he was rush, running the atrocities. And it's better to keep that quiet, even though it's not really all that controversial. Well, it's really easy to continue, and I'll stop. Uh, but this, we could go on for hours like this. Uh, these differences are, you know, it really takes discipline not to see them. They are so overwhelmingly transparent. Uh, and the fact that they are literally unmentioned uh, is, uh, again, a major tribute to our educational institutions. It takes, uh, you, know, you have to give them credit for being able to create people like us, uh, me too, you know, go through these things and come out well trained. Uh, so as not to see things that are so glaringly obvious and so humanly significant. You know, it's not like missing some triviality. We're talking about things of extraordinary importance. Well, that's international terrorism if we want to peer down that abyss. Uh, and that's what we'll see if we look there with our eyes open. Uh, but uh, let me just continue a little turn over to the Middle East again. That was Central America. Uh, uh, after September 11th, uh, some of the press, particularly the Wall Street Journal, uh, did do what they should have done. They began uh, investigating uh, opinion in the, in the region to find out why people, uh, they were trying to find out the answer to George Bush's plaintive question, uh, why do they hate us when we're so good? You know, how can that be? <laughs> uh, so within, uh, actually, before, even before he asked the question, the Wall Street Journal had provided some of the answers. Uh, they did do what they should have done. They did an investigation of uh, opinions in the region. Now they kept to the people they care about. So they had a, it was what they called moneyed Muslims, meaning bankers, uh, lawyers, uh, managers of, branches of U.S. Corp. Transnationals, that kind of people. People are right inside the U.S. system. And of course, naturally despise Osama bin Laden because they're his main targets. Uh, they're the ones he's after, so they don't like him. Uh, and in that group, uh, uh, you can't, uh, uh, what, what's their opinion about the United States? Well, it turns out they're they're very antagonistic to U.S. policy, uh, though they're in, in the main policies they're just part of, you know, like the international economic policies. But what they, what, what they object to is the fact that the United States has consistently opposed uh, a, a democracy, a independent development, uh, supporting corrupt, brutal regimes. Uh, is, uh, the, they're naturally strongly opposed to the unilateral U.S. support for the Israeli military occupation, which is very harsh and brutal, it's now in its 35th year, strongly oppose the U.S. sanctions against Iraq, which they understand perfectly well, and you know too, so I won't go into it, are devastating the population, but strengthening Saddam Hussein. And they remember another thing that we like to forget, uh, that the United States and Britain supported him right through his worst atrocities, helped him continued to help him develop weapons of mass destruction, didn't see anything wrong with gas and curds or anything else. Uh, they remember that even if we choose to uh, uh, sweep it under the carpet. Uh, and for reasons like that, they say they you know, have a lot of hatred of U.S. policies, despite the fact that they're right in the middle of the entire U.S. system. Well, that's one answer to uh, uh, George Bush's question. It's not the kind of answer you read in most of the intellectual journals and the press and so on. There you read sophisticated answers. Uh, 
about how people of that region uh, have bad cultures or they are left out by globalization uh, or they you know, can't stand their freedoms and their magnificence and so on and so <laughs> forth. Uh, anyone who is seriously concerned with these issues, certainly anyone who's a specialist in international affairs or the Middle East, knows that there's nothing new about these answers. Uh, you can go way back and find them as far back as you want to go. Uh, one of the good places to look, w one of the advantages of living here, uh, is that the United States has become, over the years, a very free country. Not a gift from the gods, but as a result of plenty of popular struggle, it's become an unusually free country. Uh, uniquely so in some respects. We have more information about US, high level US policy planning than you can find about any country in the world that I know about. Uh, tons of declassified material which show, shows how policy is being conducted and what the thinking is. Uh, well, obvious place to look if you want to find out more about this uh, is the records for 1958. The reason is that 1958 was a critical year in U.S. international affairs for a lot of reasons. I'll explain it later if you like. But in particular with regard to the Middle East, it was a critical year because it was the first year in which some country, namely Iraq, uh, had been able to break out of the Anglo-American uh, condominium over the world's energy resources. Iran had tried, conservative nationalist regime, but they were uh, there, there was a military coup, that, a U.S.-British military coup that overthrew it. Iraq actually broke out and it was a huge issue, big flurry of activity, uh, military forces all over the place uh, almost came to nuclear weapons. Uh, it was an enormous issue. So if you want to understand what the U.S. was thinking about, you look back to those records. Well, if you do, you find that uh, President Eisenhower, in, in internal discussion, uh, observed to his staff, his words, that there's a campaign of hatred against us in the Middle East, uh, not by governments, but by the people. Uh, and there was discussion about this. The National Security Council, the highest planning body, uh, gave their analysis. Uh, they said that there is, the reason is that there's a perception in the region that the United States is supporting harsh and brutal and corrupt regimes. Uh, uh, and is blocking democratization and development and is doing so because of our interest in controlling the oil reserves of the region. And they said it's difficult to counter this perception because it's accurate. And not only is it, not only is it accurate, but it should be accurate. It said it is natural for us to support uh, status quo governments, meaning the kind I just described, uh, and to prevent democracy and development because we want to maintain control over the uh, energy resources of the region. So there's a campaign of hatred against us by the people uh, and that's the reason for it. Uh, essentially the same as what the Wall Street Journal discovered on September 14th uh, and uh, anybody knew in between. Uh, the only difference is that, of course, some of the specific policies like the sanctions against Iraq are new and so on, but the general policies are the same. Uh, and they're talking about the people, not just m money Muslims. Uh, and among the people, there's a much deeper resentment uh, because they don't see any particular reason why the uh, wealth of the region should flow to the West and to the moneyed Muslims but who are cooperating with the West and not to them. Uh, kind of backward cultures, as you read, and this idea somehow hadn't penetrated their minds and still hasn't, uh, so there's an even deeper campaign of hatred among the people who aren't uh, moneyed Muslims in the middle of the U.S. system. Uh, so if you want to listen to some voices outside the cocoon, it's not hard to hear them and they'll answer the questions about why there's a campaign of hatred against us, whether it's now or in 1958 uh, and in a good part of the rest of the world uh, where people just don't enjoy being ground to dust under somebody's boot. They don't like it and it leads to hatred. Uh, you can avoid, you know, you can indulge in the fantasies if you like, uh, but that's a choice. You certainly don't have to. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot more to say about this, but let me put these top 
relatively topical issues aside and look at some other things. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you read, certainly, the front page stories uh, on uh, George Bush's, uh, current Bush's, uh, nuclear posture review. Uh, the, uh, and that was kind of interesting. It wasn't interesting because of the content. There was almost nothing new in the content. Uh, what was interesting is that it was reported, uh, that it had been leaked and reported. And uh, since the content is essentially the same as everything that preceded, which was already public though not reported, uh, one wants to know why was it suddenly leaked and reported. Uh, and here we can only speculate, but my guess is uh, that there probably are people inside the administration uh, who aren't happy about the fact that certified lunatics uh, have their hand very close to the button. Uh, some, of them, some of them you may actually have run into on the Stanford campus. But uh, the, uh, 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 and I, there have been uh, a number of leaks recently which kind of suggest that there's a concern that you know, things may really get out of hand even from the point of view of elite interests. Anyway, that's a guess. Uh, what is not a guess uh, is that the content of the nuclear posture review, as far as it was revealed, is pretty much the same as the preceding 10 years. Uh, right after the uh, end of the Cold War, you know, when the Berlin Wall fell and no more Russians, uh, there, was, there were uh, quickly uh, uh, discussions of tactical changes to deal with the new situation. Some of it was public, and what's public is really sufficient uh, to natural again, and, but sufficient to gain an understanding of what's happening and where we're heading and some other abysses into which we might peer much deeper ones than international terrorism in this case. Uh, the first conclusion, which was correct by the Joint Chiefs, uh, was that um, the U.S. is no longer facing what is called technically a, a, a weapons-rich environment. Russia is a weapons-rich environment, you know, particular place, ton of weapons. We're not facing that any longer. We're now facing a target-rich environment. That is the rest of the world, uh, which is a lot of targets, but not many weapons. So we have to switch planning from a weapons-rich environment to a target-rich environment. Uh, in fact, the target-rich environment had always been the focus of the uh, military action but under the pretext that we were protecting ourselves from the weapons-rich environment. Now that's gone, the pretext is gone, and also the deterrent is gone. That was understood right away. That opens up lots of new opportunities. It does require new pretexts and new tactics. Uh, the, uh, pre the pretexts now couldn't be any longer. That the, uh, basically the plans remain more or less the same, except that you can now shift to uh, mini-nukes you know, little nuclear weapons that you can use against, uh, uh, you know, uh, places that aren't weapons rich, uh, what's called adaptive planning, uh, new techniques for dealing with uh, you know, small countries that you want to destroy. Uh, and, uh, the, and the description changed, the pretext changed. So by March 19, March 1990, just a couple of months after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the public documents of the first Bush administration explained publicly, it wasn't reported, but it was public, that uh, uh, in their presentations to Congress about the Pentagon, why we have to have the same old Pentagon system even though there's no more Russians, uh, they explained that the reason now is not that the Russians are coming, but it's the technological sophistication of third world countries. That's the phrase. That's why we need all this stuff. Uh, and uh, we also have to target any country that's capable of producing weapons of mass destruction. Well, if you go over to the chemistry le uh, department in Stanford, they'll explain to you that any country that has a high school with a chemistry lab is capable of producing weapons of mass destruction. Uh, so, and those are the countries we have to go after. Um, and that is target rich. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, as for intervention forces, our major intervention forces had always been focused at the Middle East. Huge system goes from Guam to the Azores, all Diego Garcia and the Indian Ocean, all aimed at the Middle East. It's been true for years. 
has to stay that way. The only thing that's different is the reason, uh, as the Bush presentation said, uh, we have to, they have to focus those intervention forces at the Middle East, now I'm quoting, where the threat to our interests that required military intervention could not be laid at the Kremlin's door. So, sorry, we've been lying to you for 50 years, but uh, now we've got to tell you the truth. Uh, it couldn't be laid at the Kremlin's door. That's not the threat to our interests. The threat was indigenous. Uh, it's indigenous nationalism, uh, independence, what efforts at independence, what's called uh, radical nationalism in the, tech, in the technical literature. Uh, that's why we need the intervention forces. Uh, notice that the threat couldn't be laid at Saddam Hussein's door either, because this was March 1990, uh, and he was still a great friend and ally of George Bush. In fact, just then, uh, Bush was Bush number one, uh, had sent a high-level senatorial delegation headed by Bob Dole to uh, visit Saddam and bring the president's good wishes and assure him that if he heard some negative criticism from U.S. reporters, it's just that some of these guys are out of line and this free press business makes it hard to shut him up, but he doesn't have to pay any attention to him. Anyway, he wasn't hearing very much, but the little he might have heard, he can sort of forget about. Uh, that's when uh, the threat to our interests was not laid at the Kremlin's door, or obviously Iraq's. Well, then comes uh, preparation, technical preparation for what they call small-scale conflict. A small scale, small is a relative notion. I mean, they may be small for us, but they're not small for the victims. Like, there's nothing small about the terrorist war against Nicaragua from their point of view, or El Salvador, or Guatemala, or Haiti, and on down a long list. Small from our point of view. Uh, well, let me give you some of the flavor of the Clinton era documents, which are worth listening to, uh, and you might compare them with the current nuclear posture review. It says the, this is Clinton. Uh, the United States should have a, this, um, this strategic command, you know, the high, highest level uh, part of the Pentagon that deals with uh, strategic weapons, uh, STRATCOM. Uh, this is from a, a crucial document of theirs, <clears throat> which was gotten on the Freedom of Information Act a couple of years ago, called Essentials of Post-Cold -war, Post War Deterrence. So major thinking about how to carry out what's called deterrence. Deterrence, of course, means attack. Uh, on uh, uh, the, uh, in the post-war period. And it says the U.S. should have available the full range of responses, but nuclear weapons are the most important of these because unlike chemical or biological weapons, the extreme destruction from a nuclear explosion is immediate with few, if any, palliatives to reduce its effect. And then it says, though we are not likely, thank goodness for that, we're not likely to use nuclear weapons in less than matters of the greatest national importance or in less than extreme circumstances. They have to be available all the time because they cast their shadow over any crisis or conflict, uh, and we therefore have to have them. Then there's a section called Maintaining Ambiguity, and it says it's important that uh, planners should not be too rational about determining what the opponent values the most, it all has to be targeted. Uh, it hurts to portray ourselves as too fully rational and cool-headed that the United States may become irrational and vindictive <laughs> if its vital interests are attacked, should be part of the national persona we project. It's beneficial for our strategic posture if some elements may appear to be potentially out of control. And it goes on to say, if this sounds familiar, it's not an accident, uh, nuclear weapons seem destined to be the centerpiece of U.S. strategic deterrence for the foreseeable future. We must therefore reject any no first use policy. There never has been one, but we must not institute one. We make it clear that our reaction may either be response or preemptive. Actually, that notion of preemptive reaction is an interesting one, which tells you what deterrence means. So we have to have preemptive reaction, uh, which means undermining the stated goal of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, we should not agree to any so-called negative security assurances that ban the use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear states uh, that are parties to the treaty. 
Uh, all of this has apparently been confirmed by uh, Clinton's uh, internal nuclear posture review, parts of which have been declassified, and subsequent presidential directives. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the old nuclear posture stand, and the new one is not very different. Uh, interesting question is why it was suddenly publicized, you heard my guess. Uh, for the future, we also have to face for ourselves now, back to terrorism, uh, the fact that small nukes uh, can be smuggled into any country, including the United States, with no difficulty. Uh, there's a recent high-level technical report, I'm quoting it, uh, which says, uh, well-planned operations to smuggle weapons of mass destruction into the United States would have at least a 90% probability of success, much higher than ICBM delivery. So that raises the question, what's missile defense about uh, if uh, those threats are so enormous? Uh, and the answer is uh, the missile defense program does have an effect on existing threats, namely it enhances them. And furthermore, that's understood. It's not a secret. Uh, so much of the fuss about ballistic missile defense these days uh, is uh, criticism about whether it'll work. Uh, so critics say it's not going to work, too easy to fool it. But I think they're missing the point. Uh, it's much more dangerous if it looks like it might work. Uh, it's enough for it to look as though it might work. Because in this kind of deadly game, appearance and reality are the same thing. Nobody can take a chance. So if it looks like it might work, uh, adversaries, potential adversaries, are going to have to interpret the system as if it would work. They have to, just as we would if it was inverted. Uh, and uh, U.S. intelligence has been very clear about the consequences. Uh, they point out, have for years, as Clinton years, that uh, uh, if the U.S. deploys a system that looks realistic, uh, that's going, I'm quoting now, that'll impel China to develop new nuclear armed missiles, expanding its arsenal tenfold, probably with MIRVs, multiple warheads, uh, prompting India and Pakistan to respond with their own buildups, that then leads to a ripple effect throughout the Middle East. Uh, and the same intelligence officials predict that Russia and China both would increase proliferation, including selling countermeasures uh, to such nations as North Korea, Iran, and Iraq, and Syria. Uh, they also point out that Russia's only rational response to the national missile defense system would be to maintain and strengthen the existing Russian nuclear force. Okay, that's the analysis of U.S. intelligence about uh, deploying a system that has even a likelihood of working. Uh, the Bush administration agrees. Uh, they announced on September 1st that uh, they have no objection to, I'm reading, the, quoting from the press now, they have no objection to China's plans to build up its small fleet of nuclear missiles. That's shifting policy pretty sharply in the hope of getting Chinese acquiescence to the then planned, now implemented uh, uh, demolition of the ABM Treaty. Uh, for similar reasons, uh, Clinton, uh, Clinton's negotiators had already encouraged Russia to adopt uh, what's called a launch on warning strategy, computerized strategy that says, you know, if you, some computer senses a danger, send off the missiles. Uh, they, uh, Clinton negotiators had urged Russia to do that. Uh, reason, same reason, to try to get them to acquiesce to the programs we're carrying out. Uh, some experts, uh, uh, nuclear experts who were asked about this uh, regarded it as, in their words, pretty bizarre uh, because we know that uh, the, their computerized systems are deteriorating, their warning systems are deteriorating and full of holes, uh, prone to false alarms that increases uh, the threat of Russian unauthorized accidental uh, or erroneous launches, meaning destruction, we're finished, you know, and that increases the threat. Uh, the administration also announced plans to, uh, September 1st again, to share detailed information uh, on its missile defense programs with China. That's going to enhance China's capacity to uh, overcome any U.S. Uh, uh, systems and also to transfer information uh, to others who have similar concerns about being targeted. Uh, strategic analysts point out that that change of policy encourages China to aim more nuclear-armed missile, missiles at the United States and Japan 
with the expected effect on Japanese and Taiwanese programs, as well as India, and then onwards. Uh, same day that all this was reported, the national press also reported independently that the U.S. would impose, was about to impose sanctions on China for allowing the transfer to Pakistan of missile parts and technology that are essentially for weapons that can carry nuclear warheads. It's all happening at the same time. Uh, the, uh, uh, clearly, the, and it's understood, programs like missile defense increase the danger of destruction for the United States and for others. Uh, but that's just not important. Uh, and furthermore, it's not new. Uh, that's the whole history of, uh, that's military history, including the history of uh, the arms race for the last 50 years. So just think about that. Uh, 50 years ago, around 1950, there was only one, uh, the U.S. had an overwhelming security, but there was a potential threat on the horizon. It didn't exist yet, but it might come into existence. Uh, that was ICBMs with thermonuclear warheads. They weren't around, but sooner or later they would come around. Uh, what was the react? It was understood. You know, everybody knew that's the that is a real potential threat to the United States. How is it dealt with? Well, there's a history of the uh, standard history, the arms race, by uh, McGeorge Bundy. He was Kennedy Johnson National Security Advisor. He had access to internal records and so on. And he writes in his history that he could find no record of any interest, even any interest, uh, in pursuing the possibility of banning these things, which the Russians probably would have accepted. They were so far behind and so much more threatened by them that there's every possibility they would have agreed to a treaty that banned them. But there was never any interest in this, even though it was the only potential threat to the United States and a non-trivial threat uh, Eisenhower once pointed out that a nuclear war would destroy the Northern Hemisphere. That was a threat, but there was no interest in uh, trying to uh, even move towards negotiations that might deter it. Uh, the fact of the matter is that if you really look over history, including our own, the threat, threats to survival are considered quite uh, marginal, ranked rather low on the value scale. Uh, as compared with others like enhancing uh, global dominance. That's a kind of a constant throughout history. The difference today is the scale of the threat, which is significant. Uh, well, uh, there's a lot of, as you know, lots of Russian archives have been coming out. Actually, there is, people are poring over them to see if they can find some justification for uh, U.S. Cold War policies, and there's not much. But there is some interesting material coming out. Uh, some, one of, part of what's coming out of the Russian archives is a confirmation of what had already been uh, uh, discussed by U.S. strategic analysts, some of them from inside the intelligence community in the Pentagon who left and have described it. Now it's confirmed by the Russian archives. Uh, the basic story is that, uh, confirmed now by the archival sources on both sides, is that after Stalin's death, uh, well, after Khrushchev took over, mid-50s, uh, his view was that the United States, in his words, was using the arms race uh, to destroy the far weaker Soviet economy uh, and by that means to obtain its goals even without war. Point is, as he and everybody else knew, the U.S. economy is far larger. If the U.S. runs an extensive arms race and the Russians try to keep up, it'll destroy their economy and Khrushchev understood that that's uh, U.S. policy. Uh, he therefore, over the strong objections of his own military command, we now know this from Russian sources, he uh, initiated a sharp reduction in Soviet offensive military forces uh, and called on the United States to reciprocate. Well, the Eisenhower administration considered it and rejected it, uh, but the death blow to this was given by the Kennedy administration. Uh, at that point, Khrushchev made really sharp cuts, called for reciprocity. It was discussed internally and rejected. Uh, I'll just quote from the leading scholarly study of the archival records on both sides by Matthew Evangelista. Uh, he points out that the Kennedy refusal and their choice instead of a huge escalation of uh, offensive armament, he said that uh, uh, drove the last nail into the coffin of Khrushchev's agenda, uh, 
of restraining the Soviet military. He was kicked out soon after that, and the arms race picks up and goes on. Uh, that's confirmed by internal US sources. Now we have it from both sides. Uh, the Soviet reaction to the Kennedy escalation and rejection of these efforts uh, also terminated uh, Khrushchev's um, reformist programs internally. They might have averted, in fact, it's not impossible, that they would have averted this whole social and economic catastrophe is for the first of all the stagnation of the Soviet economy from the 1960s which was a result of this and the immense human catastrophe of the past decade which is almost historically without precedent as well as the destruction of Afghanistan uh, all kind of other atrocities not to speak of the very serious danger of nuclear destruction because it's come very close in the past 40 years uh, but all of that was evidently regarded as a kind of secondary concern by the Kennedy planners and their predecessors and indeed their successors. Uh, well, without going on with this, uh, there isn't any real novelty in the Clinton and Bush preferences. You look over time, the correlation between security policies and concern for security is very weak. Uh, it's historically the case, it's the case now. Uh, the uh, uh, so what's the ballistic missile defense for? Well, the first thing to bear in mind about it is that everyone takes it to be an offensive weapon, not a defensive weapon. And that's a you know, kind of doctrinal truism. When you hear the word defense, you interpret it as meaning offense. Uh, and in this case, it's assumed that that's assumed both by adversaries and by advocates. So for example, the, uh, uh, these plans have of course been escalated all of them, not just the missile defense plans, but the much bigger plans for militarization of space, of which they're a small component. Uh, they were escalated very sharply after September 11th. Uh, the Bush administration uh, saw kind of a window of opportunity uh, for, to kind of exploit the fear and the concerns of the population and the demands for patriotism, meaning you shut up, uh, to sharply escalate its own agenda on everything including a major attack against the population, you know, destroying social welfare systems, you know all about this, I don't have to go into it, uh, but also vastly expanding the militarization programs, including the space militarization programs, which they know perfectly well pose a very severe danger far beyond international terrorism to the existence of not only the United States, but in this case, the human species. Uh, the, uh, uh, as I said, even the small component that's missile defense is understood to be an offensive weapon. So China, for example, says just says what everybody knows when they observe the top officials that once the United States believes it has both a strong spear and a strong shield, it could lead them to conclude that nobody can harm the United States and they can harm uh, anybody they like anywhere in the world. Well, the U.S. RAND Corporation, the top uh, military analysis agency, they agree in the same words virtually. Uh, they point out that ballistic missile defense, I'm quoting, is not simply a shield, but an, an, an enabler of U.S. action. And the logic is obvious. You have a shield, you have a spear. You know, it's pretty obvious. Uh, and, the, uh, and strategic analysts agree. So uh, kind of at the right end of the spectrum in the, the journal National Interest, uh, well-known analyst uh, Andrew Basevich writes that by insulating the homeland from reprisal, missile defense will underwrite the capacity and willingness of the United States to shape the environment elsewhere. And he cites approvingly a commentator from the liberal end of the spectrum, the opposite end, uh, Lawrence Kaplan in the New Republic, who says missile defense isn't really meant to protect America, it's a tool for global dominance. It's about preserving America's ability to wield power abroad. It's not about defense, it's about offense, and that's exactly why we need it. Uh, he says it'll provide the United States with absolute freedom in using or threatening to use force in international relations. Uh, he, Kaplan, uh, the New Republic, repeats China's complaint uh, which he thinks is correct, and he approves of it, uh, namely that uh, uh, it will give the United States the opportunity to do what 
it wants. Uh, it will, in his words, cement U.S. hegemony and make Americans masters of the world. And that's the way things should be. And for exactly that reason, he says, liberal critics are missing the point. They have things exactly backwards. Uh, he says, uh, uh, missile defense will facilitate the kind of interventions that liberals champion, and therefore they should applaud it. Uh, right? You get the logic. I don't have to explain it. Uh, well, there's kind of a background to this. If you read the same authors uh, the, and many others, they explain further that there's good reason why we should be in favor of American hegemony. Uh, the reason is that history has a natural course and the United States represents uh, the realization of history's purpose. So there, I'm quoting, and therefore U.S. domination is kind of by logic beneficial to the rest of the world. If you think there's anything new about this, you haven't studied the right history courses. They're just repeating what was said by leading British intellectuals, people like John Stuart Mill and others, uh, at the peak when Britain enjoyed its day in the sun. And the same is true of, I find the same among lesser uh, aspirants for the prize. That's standard. Whoever you are, the leading intellectuals explain that you represent history's purpose and it's therefore beneficial if you rule the world. That's elementary. Uh, and therefore, if um, we have a system that allows us to exercise hegemony and rule the world, that's in everybody's interest and in fact realizes history's purpose. Now, these are the hard-headed realists. I'm not talking about the sentimental types. Uh, the, uh, now, there is a kind of a problem about missile defense, kind of like a technical paradox, which you can see discussed in the, uh, you know, even in journals like, say, Foreign Affairs, the main establishment journal. The problem is that missile defense relies on satellites, uh, and satellites are very easy to shoot down. Uh, they're much easier to shoot down than missiles. You know, missiles, you don't know where they're going, and you know, anything else. Satellites, they're right there, you can track them. It's shooting down satellites is kind of like poor man's technology. So how can you have, uh, if we destroy, as we already have, the uh, anti-ABM anti uh, treaties, well, that means anti-satellite weapons are now legitimate, and that undermines the possibility of missile defense, so it's kind of like a paradox. Uh, but there's an answer. Uh, the paradox is, uh, um, it's at least in some imagined world, there's an answer. The answer is what's called full spectrum dominance. Uh, that means such overwhelming uh, superiority over everyone else uh, that uh, nobody can even use the poor man's weapon uh, because we will have offensive weapons in space. Here's where the rest of the story comes in. We'll have offensive weapons in space of extreme destructive power probably nuclear powered because there's no other way to get that much energy up there. Uh, and they'll be ready for launch with instant computer uh, controlled uh, reaction because can't waste any time in these cases. Uh, well, uh, that's, uh, uh, that uh, very much increases the risk of uh, total destruction, mass slaughter and destruction, uh, on if only because of uh, what are called in the trade literally, normal accidents. Uh, normal accidents are the kind of accidents that uh, occur in any complicated system, unpredictably. You know are going to occur, you just don't know when or why. I mean, anybody who has a computer or has tried to install DSL or take BART, <laughs> you know, like I took BART today and at one point the doors decided they weren't going to open or something like that. Uh, that kind of thing is what's called a normal accident uh, and it's going to happen. Uh, in any complicated system. It's even it's almost provable. Uh, and this kind of thing guarantees normal accidents along the line. Uh, and that one, once the first one happens, you can say goodbye. That's the end of everything. Uh, well, the goals of militarization of space, in fact, go way beyond this. And this is all public documents. There's no reason not to know it. Uh, the Clinton, uh, Clinton documents of the Space Command, in charge of this stuff, uh, they actually publish brochures for, pu for public use. You know, like you look at the front page, and it's like a kind of thing that, you know, people give to 
corporate executives with big words and underlining so <laughs> the dumbest person can follow it, that sort of thing. Uh, on the front page of the document, called, uh, there's one called Vision for 2020, and it announces the primary goal of militarization of space, namely dominating the space dimension of military operations to protect U.S. interests and investment. Uh, and that's described accurately as the next plausible stage in a historic task. So in the first, uh, earlier on, you know, people developed, countries developed armies, like the United States, they said, needed an army during the westward expansion of the continental United States, which of course was in self-defense. I don't have to <laughs> comment about that. Uh, and nations also built navies to protect and enhance their commercial interests. And the next logical step is space forces, uh, quoting still, to protect U.S. national interests, military and commercial, and investment. That's just normal. That includes nuclear, uh, national missile defense, but also space-based strike weapons enabling the application of precision force from, to, and through space. So that's the next step beyond navies. But this is going to be different from navies in one crucial respect. Uh, the British could construct a huge navy, but it could be countered, like Germany could build a navy to counter it, and Japan could build a navy and that had certain consequences which we don't have to talk about. Uh, but this is going to be different. Uh, the reason is that the United States will be so far in the lead, uh, so overwhelmingly dominate, uh, dominant in uh, militarization of space and placing destructive uh, offensive military weapons there on, uh, uh, on uh, 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 computer-controlled alert uh, that nobody will be able to counter it, at least in the imagined world. Uh, that'll make the U.S. immune. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have to vastly outspend all adversaries and uh, allies combined and even increase it further. Requires total dominance, so nothing can counter U.S. hegemony, which, remember, is for the benefit of the world by logic. Uh, and uh, the U.S. will then remain immune except for one thing that very narrowly circumscribed category of terrorism which is allowed to enter the canon because somebody else does it to us. Uh, well, they go on, interestingly, to say that this need for, to I'm talking about the military planners, the need for total dominance will increase as a result of the globalization of the world economy. Now, the reason is that globalization is expected to bring about a widening of the divide between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, that's an assessment which is shared by U.S. intelligence and by U.S. academic specialists. A uh, big study was just put out uh, under CIA auspices, but it's the whole intelligence agencies with outside academic experts and others, uh, called uh, it's uh, planning for the next 15 years. And their conclusion is that globalization should proceed on course, though its evolution will be rocky, marked by chronic financial volatility, which incidentally translates into lower, lower, slower growth and more suffering for the poor majority, and also a widening economic divide. Okay, that's the prediction if everything works right. You know, <laughs> slower growth and a widening economic divide. Uh, the military planners make the same assessment, and they're concerned that the widening divide is going to lead to unrest among the have-nots, you know, the growing numbers of have-nots, and that, of course, requires that the U.S. has the force to control it uh, as, uh, use, quoting them, using space systems and planning for a precision strike from space as a counter to the worldwide proliferation of weapons of mass destruction by unruly elements, which is a predictable consequence of the recommended programs and is pretty easy in the future, just as the widening divide is an expected consequence of the uh, preferred form of globalization. And notice that that's counter to the economic theories that are professed, right? According to the economic theories that you study at Stanford, uh, globalization is supposed to lead to a single market, right? That's the measure of international integration. But what's expected is exactly the opposite, namely it's going to lead to a widening divide, uh, which is correct for the form of globalization that is intended. It's not international economic integration, 
it's a particular form of corporate-oriented globalization, which is sometimes described honestly. So like the Wall Street Journal describes what, what are presented publicly as free trade agreements, they call them free investment agreements, and that's correct. Uh, that kind of globalization, uh, you expect to reduce globalization in the technical sense, but to increase it in the doctrinally preferred sense with much slower growth, which has been a characteristic of the past 25 years anyway. It's going to slow even more because of increasing financial volatility, uh, more suffering, and a widening divide, meaning less globalization in the sense of an economics course, uh, but more in the sense of reality. Uh, you know, preferred doctrine at least. Well, the, they could have gone on to give a deeper historical background. It's getting late and I won't do it. But if you look at the history of industrialization, history of industrial development, uh, you discover very quickly that it's, since the 18th century, the modern industrial revolution, it's been very heavily military based. Uh, that includes the American system of uh, mass production that amazed the world and the 19th century, which came out of uh, uh, armories, Springfield Armory mainly. Uh, it includes the basis of the automotive industry. Uh, uh, a century ago, the main technical problems in mechanical and electrical engineering uh, had to do with things like placing a huge gun emplacement on a moving object, namely a ship, and trying to set it up so it could hit another moving object, namely another ship. Uh, those were problems which are kind of analogous to the problems of space vehicles today. And working on those within the military system made it possible to socialize the costs and the risks, means the public pays for them under the military cover, but then privatize the profits if anything works out. And that's exactly what's expected from the current space system. Uh, and in fact, anyone who looks at the modern economy knows that's how it developed. So the so-called new economy, you know, computers and telecommunications and all that kind of stuff, almost entirely comes out of the very dynamic state sector. Uh, that's why uh, if you look at the, at the World Trade Organization rules, you know, they have a thing called a national security exemption, uh, which means uh, that you're allowed to violate the rules for national security. Well, national security means anything having to do with the military, and for the United States, that means the whole cutting edge of the economy for the last 50 years and for the future, and in fact, the good bit of the past. And the same for other industrial countries. Doesn't do Haiti much good, but for uh, the guys who run the world, the masters of the universe, uh, it does them a lot of good. Uh, well, throughout history, it has been understood that all of this is very dangerous. Uh, and in fact, that's, you know, we, we have a history of wars that tells us how dangerous it is. What's different now is just the scale, and the scale is qualitatively different, not slight differences. Well, I'm going to stop. Uh, there's a lot more to say about all of this. These are the some, some not all, of the deep abysses into which we ought to be peering. Uh, the good side of the story, uh, which there really is less need to talk about because we all know it and we don't have to congratulate ourselves on achievements, but there have been plenty of them. I mentioned uh, that we're now commemorating uh, the 40th anniversary of the attack on South Vietnam without any notice. The reason there's no notice is because there was no protest uh, at that point in, say, Berkeley or anywhere else. Uh, nobody cared if the United States was going to start bombing another country and attack it with chemical warfare. That's fine. That's what we do. Uh, no American president could conceivably do anything like that today. It took years at that time before any protest developed. Uh, out of that protest and the parallel civil rights movement and other popular developments, big changes took place. Uh, one change that took, I mean, the changes that took place over the past 30 or 40 years have made the country a, a lot more civilized. There couldn't conceivably have been a meeting like this uh, 40 years ago or probably even 20 years ago. There's been a constant improvement place is just a lot more civilized uh, in, every, in lots of dimensions. You go back to the 1960s, there was no feminist movement, there was no environmental movement, which meant nobody cared if there's not going to be an, uh, you know, if, if there won't be an environment in which our grandchildren could survive, just wasn't an issue. Uh, there were no solidarity movements, no 
mass anti-nuclear movement, no uh, anti-apartheid movement, uh, no anti-sweatshop movements, uh, no movements opposing uh, international economic integration of the investor rights style, which was already going on. Nothing. You know? I mean, there's some, but not very much, kind of marginal. Now it's enormous. Uh, furthermore, it's worldwide. Uh, the, uh, uh, particularly with regard to international economic integration, the, what's ludicrously called globalization, uh, that, or free trade, or one of these other propaganda terms, uh, that uh, opposition to that has been going on extensively in the South, like in Brazil and in India, for years, for decades, in fact. Finally, in the last couple of years, it hit the North, in Seattle. That's why you constantly read. And when it's in the North, you can't ignore it. You know? Like if it's just hundreds of thousands of Indian peasants and so on, you can kind of pretend it's not happening. Uh, but when you see it in the streets of Seattle, it's happening. Uh, so therefore, that's called the beginning of the anti-globalization movement, which is ridiculous for one thing, because it's not opposed to globalization. Nobody's saying is opposed to that. And it's not starting in the North. Uh, it's, we're coming along behind, but it's a good thing uh, because it's the first time ever, ever, that there has been a real international, the beginnings of a real international. That's what's been the core ideal of the uh, the left and the working class movement since their beginning of uh, since their beginning in the 19th century, and this is the first seeds of it uh, in Porto Alegre in Brazil uh, a month ago. Uh, it was very impressive. Uh, 60, 70,000 people uh, from all over the world, uh, south, north, uh, uh, you know, every possible, uh, you know, peasants, workers, uh, environmentalists, uh, all kinds of activists, uh, essentially working on the same things, and very seriously. I mean, the descriptions in the press, which are comical, are comical because they're terrified. They're terrified of what's going on, and rightly, uh, what's going on are substantial popular movements which are completely unprecedented in scale, are growing out of the changes that have been taking place over the past few decades. Uh, it continues a historical course. I mean, there's been a long struggle to attain more, more rights, more democratic control, and it's continuing and probably accelerating. And it's a tendency running counter to the tendency towards destruction. Uh, and exactly which curve is going to move up faster will determine the fate of the species. Uh, that question is pretty much in the hands of people like you. We're going to give Professor Chomsky a couple of moments to catch his breath and write his next book, and then we'll have a question and answer session. As I mentioned, this is the Peace and Justice Center's 20th anniversary, and I know there are a whole lot of people in this room, because we looked at the ticket orders, who are not members of the Peace and Justice Center. We're going to take just a couple of minutes to tell you about the Peace and Justice Center and what a little bit of that history is, how the Peace and Justice Center fits into this movement that Professor Chomsky was just talking about. To do this, I'd like to introduce Peggy Law. She's the executive director of the National Radio Project. The National Radio Project produces a weekly half-hour program that's distributed for free to community radio stations all around the country, 150 stations, putting on the air the voices of people who need to be heard and, aren't, uh, and who are normally overlooked by the mainstream media. Please welcome Peggy Law. I'm not going to take up very much time because I know you want to get to the questions and answers. Uh, but I did want to say that I've been a supporter of the Peace and Justice Center for a couple of decades. And there's a reason for that. 
When I look at the world that our children and our grandchildren are growing into, my own and yours, it's not a very hopeful place. And the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center is one of the places that brings that hope. Professor Chomsky spoke tonight about the crimes that we never hear about. And at the center, there are people who dare day in and day out to name the crimes, to say them out loud, to bring them to the streets, to educate, to mobilize, a place where people can hold one another close when they think they're the only ones in the world uh, and around them or in their families or in their workplaces who are thinking differently and they're not alone. And they've done it now for 20 years. They have done it when we were committing crimes in Central America. And they got Representative Tom Campbell, one of only five Republicans, uh, to vote to stop aid to El Salvador. They did it when the guns quieted a bit in Central America and the new, or not new weapon, but the next weapon uh, was economics. That it was NAFTA and then GATT and the World Trade Organization, those crimes. And the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center had people in the streets. When the Gulf War came, those of you who were here then, 5,000 people in the Palo Alto streets, and then 200,000 in San Francisco, the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center being one of the main leaders of that coalition. That was a big moment in our family. Um, we had three generations in the streets and a young granddaughter puzzled and puzzled as to what all this was, th looking through a three-year-old eyes. And then she looked up and she said, I got it. I think our leader needs a timeout. <laughs> that gift for her would not have been there if the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center had not been there. It would not have been a place where she could be with others who were thinking and puzzling it out and it has changed her life and in many ways changed ours. And it's not just looking overseas, it's looking here into our own communities because it's the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center that asks the questions about the race and class bias in the obscene crime of the death penalty. And there's pastors for peace going to Cuba, women in black demonstrating against the violence in the Middle East, against the Palestinian people. Here in Palo Alto, it has been continuously, including a couple of days ago. And this is where the movement building is. Professor Chomsky referred to the hope. The hope is here, locally it's here in an institution of hope in our own communities called the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center. It is movement building here, it is movement building many of you are part of, it is movement building which is growing, and I ask you now to reach for your wallets, I ask you to reach for your checkbooks and write Peninsula Peace and Justice Center or PPJC on them, because I invite you to think of your own lives and the lives of your children, and the lives of your grandchildren, and a place of hope, and a place of naming the crimes, and a place of building the movement for a better world, the world we all want to see and deserve. And right here locally, this is what you can do. So thank you to the Peninsula Peace and Justice Center for making all of that possible, and tonight possible, because tonight would not have been possible. So the buckets are coming, and I'd be proud to put in the first check. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Peggy. Uh, for the question and answer session, since we are filming here tonight, and we have uh, the Peace and Justice Center's own video crew here, plus a documentary crew visiting from Japan who are doing a feature documentary on Professor Chomsky. If they want to talk to you afterwards, it's okay. That's what the camera in your face is. But since we are putting it on video, we'd like you to come up to the microphones on either side for your questions so we can get your questions on tape. That helps everybody in the audience hear the questions as well. So we invite you to come up to the microphones as people are getting lined up for the questions. Let me just give you a real quick rundown of some events coming up. There are flyers for all of these out on the tables. Uh, our 20th anniversary dinner, celebration dinner, 
who is coming up on May 5th, Norman Solomon, the great media critic and media analyst, will be our keynote speaker there. We have free monthly forums. First Tuesday of every month, next month is David Bacon, the labor correspondent for KPFA. The Peace and Justice Center is going to be hosting at the end of May the third national organizing conference on Iraq. We are expecting representatives from nearly 100 grassroots organizations from around the nation to gather here on the peninsula to plan a strong strategy to oppose the coming war on Iraq. We're going to need your help. We're going to need your couches, your floors, your extra rooms to house these activists. We need your help to drive people back and forth to the conference and, and from the airport. Get one of these orange flyers and give us a call and volunteer and get directly involved in the effort to stop the coming war against Iraq. We offer free classes in alternative economics. Doug Dowd, a renowned radical economist, teaches these classes for free. And Doug will tell you some interesting stories, if maybe a little elastic with the truth, uh, of his adventures with Noam Chomsky in Vietnam, for example. Wonderful storyteller. Two events coming up that we aren't organizing directly, but we certainly are endorsing and strongly urge you to attend. Next Wednesday at noon in San Francisco, a Jewish Voice for Peace will be launching their campaign to suspend U.S. military aid to Israel. Passover Liberation Rally. I love that. A Passover Liberation Rally, Wednesday, March 27th, 12 noon, at the UN Plaza in San Francisco. There are flyers for that out there. And of course, the national mobilization in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco. We need hundreds of thousands of people walking in the streets, April 20th, marching against the real axis of evil, war, racism, and poverty. Join us in all these and other coming activities. And now, I invite your questions, and I ask Professor Chomsky to come back up here. Another mic? Okay, yeah. just hold on. Yeah. Yep. Okay, hi. Uh, thanks again, Professor Thompson, for your talk. My question relates to something you alluded to a little earlier about when you talked about Haiti. Um, this summer, I had a chance to uh, hear a speech from General Romeo Dallaire, who is in charge of the, uh, the uh, UN mission in Rwanda, and basically how frustrated he was and watching genocide happen all around him, and no one really seemed to care, and the world power seemed to do anything. And his basic conclusion was that. Uh, to him, the world was an inherently just racist place um, that allowed such things to happen. And I was curious if you could comment on his rather um, pessimistic conclusion, if, if you agree with that assessment or if it should be qualified in some sense. Yeah, I, I don't think, uh, first of all, I don't think what happened was racism particularly. It's just that that didn't matter much. Remember, uh, he was talking about what happened in Rwanda in uh, 1994. But that's been going on in uh, Burundi and Rwanda for years. I mean, Ed Herman and I uh, wrote a book 20 years ago, over 23 years ago, in which we discussed the uh, Hutu uh, uh, Tutsi atrocities in uh, uh, Burundi and Rwanda, which, in which hundreds of thousands of people were killed. Uh, nobody cared then, and nobody cares now. Uh, just like in the last. Uh, just in the last two or three years, probably several million people have been killed in the, in the Congo. Uh, and uh, you know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't affect uh, Western interests, so you don't try to do anything about it. Uh, but it, they, can, they can be any color, you know, any religion. Uh, it doesn't really matter. The principle is, does it affect uh, U.S. interests? If you take a look at the Kurds who I was talking about, um, they're Aryan, you know, if anybody cares. Uh, if they walked around the streets, we'd say uh, more Aryans, maybe slightly darker skin, but we wouldn't notice. Uh, but if, a couple, if, uh, if they get slaughtered, that's fine. Uh, because, in fact, in that case, notice it's not like the lair. He's talking about something bad, namely our unwillingness to do anything to stop atrocities. But much worse than that, you know, incomparably worse, is our willingness to participate in atrocities. You know, like it would have been much worse if we had not only not done anything about that, but in fact put the, gone ahead and continued to put the guns in the hands of the murderers as they were committing murder. Uh, I, I'd be a little cautious. Um, the kind of statement he's making is correct. 
but that's the kind that's tolerable. So for example, if you take a look at the New York Review of Books this week, there's a passionate article by the head of the uh, Carr Center for Human Rights at the Kennedy School of, uh, at Harvard, uh, which is talking, discussing you know, our tragic failure uh, to uh, uh, pay attention to atrocities that other people are committing uh, and to do something about them and some profound flaw in our character. Okay, it's a problem. But a much more serious problem, like orders of magnitude more serious, which is not mentioned in the article and which would be unintelligible if it were mentioned, uh, is the fact that we pay very close attention to atrocities and intervene to escalate them. Uh, and often even applaud them. The uh, case of Turkey is only one case. No, no such examples are mentioned in the article, uh, and couldn't be. If you wrote an article about that, you wouldn't get it published, and if you did, nobody would understand it, at least nobody with a good education. Uh, and uh, that's the important point. I mean, you know, it's, yeah, it's bad to overlook the crimes that are committed by others and not to do enough about them, uh, but it's much worse and far more important uh, to look into the mirror and look what you, you're doing yourself uh, and do something about that. So yeah, I kind of agree with him, but it seems to me a bad problem, but small on the scale of moral responsibilities or human consequences. Okay, thanks. I want to also thank you, um, Dr. Ford, for your um, enlightening information about many criminal acts that have been conducted on behalf of our country. And it seems like in this room there are a lot of people who are very focused on action. And in light of what you've said here tonight and in light of what we know has gone on in Afghanistan, perhaps one of the actions that we have in front of us is divestiture in the companies that are sponsoring the, F the, the proliferation of weapons that are helping to create and, and build the ethnic tension and create atrocities after atrocities. So I wanted to ask you whether this subject of divestiture or action in this realm has been discussed elsewhere. Yeah, it's being discussed. I mean, it surely has been and should be. And sometimes it's a, it's a I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a, it's, it's a tactical question by which I don't mean a minor question, but a huge question of, huge significance. It's the tactical questions that have human consequences. But these are delicate judgments. Like you have to try to figure out what's the consequence of carrying out this act under existing circumstances and who will you reach and how will people understand it and will it be the basis for an organizing effort that will go on to something else and so on. Those are hard judgments and I certainly don't trust my own assessment of them and no reason why you should. Uh, but yeah, such campaigns have been, have sometimes been successful. Uh, in the case of South Africa, there were similar campaigns and they had an effect on U.S. policy. Uh, remember what U.S. policy was. This is one of the things that swept under the rug. So let me, uh, in 1988, okay, not that long ago, uh, Nelson Mandela's uh, African National Congress was a terrorist or an officially designated terrorist organization. In fact, worse than that, uh, the State Department listed it as one of the more notorious terrorist organizations. Uh, in the same year, 1988, uh, South Africa uh, was welcomed as a favored ally. Uh, just in the Reagan Bush years alone, in the 1980s, South Africa had killed about a million and a half people in the surrounding countries, not inside South Africa, and caused about $60 billion of damage uh, with action supported by the United States and Britain. Okay, that was 1988, okay. Uh, uh, in fact, in 1987, uh, the United Nations passed its major resolution condemning terrorism in all its forms, you know, plague, uh, et cetera, et cetera, called on all countries of the world to do everything they could to stamp out this terrible plague. Uh, That's December 1987. Uh, it didn't pass unanimously. It was almost unanimous. Uh, one country abstained, namely Honduras, and two countries voted against it, namely the United States and Israel. Uh, 
uh, which when the U.S. votes against a resolution, it disappears from, it's not reported, and it disappears from history, which is what happened to the major U.N. resolution against terrorism. And the two negative voters explained why. Uh, there was a paragraph in the resolution which said, virtually a quote, it said, nothing in this resolution shall prejudice the right of people to struggle for freedom and independence against racist and colonialist regimes and foreign military occupation and to gain support from others in accord with the Charter of the United Nations. And both the United States and Israel had to vote against that. Uh, they both understood that the phrase racist and colonialist regimes refers to South Africa and that was a valued ally while the ANC was one of the more notorious terrorist organizations so obviously they didn't have a right to struggle against apartheid uh, and foreign military occupation referred to the Israeli military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza which was maintained precisely for the same reason it is now uh, by unilateral U.S. intervention. The U.S. has been blocking a diplomatic settlement of this uh, for over 30 years now. Uh, the process of preventing a diplomatic settlement has a name. It's called the peace process, literally. <laughs> the peace process is, refers to whatever the U.S. happens to be doing, very often preventing political settlement, as in this case. And in this case, it's unilateral. Uh, and therefore, and it's not a pretty regime. It's harsh and brutal and has been from the beginning, uh, still is. Uh, and uh, therefore, the U.S. and Israel had to vote against uh, that qualification. Well, that was 1988. Okay, within a couple of years, just a few years, three or four years, the United States had been compelled to shift its position on South Africa. It had been compelled by popular action, including uh, divestment campaigns. Uh, which didn't really affect the companies very much, but had a big symbolic effect uh, on uh, undermining U.S. Uh, uh, US uh, actions, which went around, I mean, there was technically an embargo, but U.S. trade with South Africa increased under the embargo, because nobody, they weren't paying any attention to it uh, for the reasons I just mentioned. Uh, but the popular campaign shifted it. On the other case, they haven't yet shifted it. Uh, but they could, and the same is, and in fact, there is, there are proposals for divestment campaigns on that, uh, and on military weapons. Yes, definitely. Now you have to, of course, understand that when you talk about military producers, you're talking about virtually the whole high-tech economy. Okay, like you can't pick out the military producers and leave the rest. As I mentioned, military production has been the cover for almost everything. You know, computers, lasers. Uh, telecommunications, the internet, uh, automation, uh, uh, you know, you can barely mention anything, all, practically all of electronics. In fact, if you look at government spending, uh, you'll notice, if the scientists among you will certainly know this, that in the last couple of years, uh, spending on the biology-based areas has been rapidly increasing. There's a reason for that. Uh, every senator and guy in Congress, person in Congress, uh, no matter how right-wing they are, in fact, the right-wingers know it better than the rest, uh, understands that the way the economy works is you have to have a dynamic state sector in which the public assumes the costs and the risks, and if anything comes out, you put it into deep corporate profits. That's what's called free enterprise when you take an <laughs> economics course. Uh, that's the way it works. And the cutting edge of the economy in the future is very likely to be the biology-based industries, uh, biotech and genetic engineering, that kind of stuff. So therefore, there has to be a lot more money going into basic biology and uh, applications of it. Now, under the uh, pretext of fighting bioterrorism, uh, uh, that's, uh, and you should see some of the things that are going on under that pretext. Uh, so for example, the, uh, as you know, the US, I should know, the, uh, 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 the US just destroyed the uh, international effort, six-year effort, to try to set up an anti-bioterrorism treaty, verification procedure for that. It was, the Clinton administration was opposed to it uh, primarily because it did not protect uh, what are U.S. commercial interests, that is the interest of U.S. pharmaceutical and um, biotech companies since the verification system might 
look into their, what they're up to. So the Clinton administration was opposed, but the Bush administration just killed it, said, period. Uh, there were a number of reasons, one, one I just mentioned, but there are others. Uh, it turned out that the U.S. is violating the uh, treaties that already exist uh, against bioterrorism. Uh, one of the ways it's doing it is by genetic engineering. Uh, apparently there, there, are, there is an effort to uh, genetically engineer uh, vaccine uh, resistant anthrax strains. Okay, that's the, considered the nightmare scenario among microbiologists, to create strains of a killer, uh, whatever it happens to be, virus, bacteria, whatever it is, but can uh, develop strains that will be resistant to any vaccine or treatment. Uh, that's always been assumed to have been banned, but apparently the U.S. has been doing it, and there are a couple of other similar projects, and that's going to go on under, uh, uh, you know, pretext of protection against bioterrorism. But the main thing that will go on is developing the science and technology which will allow the biology-based industries of the future to be dominated by the United States. So when you talk about going after weapons producers, it's a very broad category. In Maybe fact, we could pick out, um, yeah, you might pick out right. So that's you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it has to be understood that these are symbolic gestures, which doesn't make them unimportant. They're symbolic, but extremely important, uh, and they can be important if used as an educational and organizing device. Uh, that's very important. So no illusions about you're going to shut down weapons production. Obviously not. That means shutting down the economy. Uh, but uh, uh, very important, just like in the South African case, because it's a way of organizing and educating, and it can have big effects. Within a couple of years, it shifted U.S. policy on that. Thank you, Professor, for coming. I love your talks and books. I just want to say that I have a quick comment and a question here. Uh, as an Egyptian-American, I lived on both sides of the fence for 20 years each, and I will tell you as a comment. As an Egyptian, uh, the only way we change presidents is to have them assassinated. <laughs> 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 and and when, we hear, when we hear the U.S. is interested in democracy, we, we dig it, really dig it, because it, it makes us laugh. That's my comment. Uh, my, my question is... Uh, uh, Herring, uh, last December, had an excellent article about the Carlyle Group and the relationship between Senior Bush and the uh, Bin Laden's family. <laughs> and the defense, the floundering uh, defense industry and how they're pushing for war. Would you be kind enough to uh, allude to that, please? Uh, about the, the relations between the Bush family and bin Laden's... Um, and and yeah, the defense and the ministry, yeah. the defense yeah. industry, the Lockheed Martin, right. uh, big contract for $100 yeah. billion. Dollar. Yeah, there uh, was a... Uh, uh, it, it's pretty hard to find out about this because there's been very little investigation of it, as far as I know. But I think it, was in, it must have been in early November. There was a BBC... Uh, news program uh, which discussed uh, connections between Bush and the guys around him uh, and the bin Laden family and efforts, alleged efforts by the Bush administration to cut down investigation of uh, bin Laden's family and associates. Okay, That was over BBC, one of their main news programs. Uh, it was over the wire services, naturally. I didn't see any reporting of it. Um, very, actually, I happened to be in India at the time, and the Times of India did run a report on it. But when I got back to the United States and tried to check up, I couldn't find anything. Uh, maybe there was. I didn't really do a full database search, so maybe there was some reporting. But as far as I know, there has been no further serious investigation of it. Uh, but it's very likely. You know? I mean, uh, if anybody were to look into, say, Cheney's uh, operations, it looks very likely. I mean, I don't know enough to prove it. I'm not sure enough is around to prove it, but I'll bet anything that it's going to turn out that uh, Halliburton, his company, uh, was getting a very substantial part of its uh, profit from uh, Iraqi oil and Iranian oil and natural gas uh, through various offshore you know, the companies and so on. Uh, and as soon as you start opening this can of worms up, uh, Enron is going to look like uh, a tea party. Uh, but nobody, and that's, I suppose, why nobody's looking at it. Uh, notice there's only one way to get answers to these questions. Corporations, remember, are totalitarian institutions. They are the most perfect totalitarian institutions that humans have ever created. Uh, 
totally totalitarian. In fact, their origins, their intellectual origins are more or less the same as those of Bolshevism and fascism uh, uh, go into that. But they are totalitarian institutions and they're almost unaccountable to the public. Almost. Not entirely. Congress has the capacity to investigate them. So Congress can subpoena records of the totalitarian institutions and has occasionally done so. Uh, there was one major case and most of our knowledge of multinational corporations comes from these, this one series of inquiries, namely the Church Committee uh, around 1975 uh, had, uh, this is right in the wake of all the, you know, the activism and the popular movements and you know, anti-war movement, the whole business. There was a lot of uh, turmoil in the country and in that context, uh, Frank Church's Senate Committee uh, did carry out a series of investigations of multinational c corporations many, many volumes, and they're very interesting. So practically everything we know about the energy corporations comes from the inquiries of the multinational oil, MNOC, multinational oil companies' inquiries of uh, the church committee. And they could do it in this case too, but nobody else can do it. I mean, there's no way for you and me uh, to get access to the internal records of these totalitarian institutions. They're protected from people, uh, except through the um, uh, parliamentary inquiries, congressional inquiries. So pressure on Congress could, uh, in principle at least, uh, lead to inquiry that could answer these questions. There's almost no other way to do it. I mean, you know, investigative reporting can pick, pick, pick up uh, bits and pieces, but to really get to the heart of it, you have to be able to subpoena the basic records. It's, it's kind of like, you know, governments do declassify documents, not everything, but at least some. Uh, governments, you know, at least more governments that have been under enough pressure so they've become more or less free, like ours, uh, do have, are to some extent accountable to their citizens. You can get a fair amount of information about what the government's doing to you. Uh, and uh, uh, incidentally, most of the, those of you who've worked on secret records, declassified records, will know uh, something which shouldn't be a secret. Namely, there's almost nothing in them that has anything to do with security. Almost everything in them has to do with protecting the government from scrutiny by the public. Uh, <laughs> all, uh, just take, do a careful study sometime. That's what you find. They want to protect themselves from public scrutiny. So say, take what are called clandestine operations. Uh, who are they secret from? Like they're not secret from the targets, obviously. They know all about them. Uh, they're not secret from the other states that are hired to carry them out. Uh, they know all about them. Uh, they're not even secrets from the media. You know, they're just kind of low enough levels. So you don't have to report them. Uh, the main, uh, they are mainly secret from the population in the United States. That's who they have to be kept secret from. And when the documents come out, you know, 30 years later, that's what you find out. Uh, but uh, governments are at least to some extent accountable to the public, corporations are not. And therefore it's really hard to pursue, the, it's a very important question and hard to pursue. I mean frankly I don't think that George Bush is going to, there'll be much about him, he's too small a player, he's a nothing person. But the people around him, uh, uh, they're important and probably there are huge scandals there just barely beneath the surface. Thank you. Actually, I did a lot of research on the connections between Bush, the CIA, oh, yeah. and 9-11, mm -hmm. and Kevin Donaher had the idea of demanding a congressional inquiry because there was just so much information all over the internet. So I compiled about three or four inches of documents for our senators, and we marched on them in January demanding a congressional inquiry of 9-11, and we specifically wanted to know about Bush and Cheney's relationships with the oil companies, the drug industries, Al-Qaeda, and Michelle Chasudovsky compiled some great articles and I just have a stack of his new magazine, Global Outlook, which has what he considers to be the truth of 9-11. And um, shortly after that uh, march, uh, both Bush and Cheney asked Congress to limit the investigations to just the CIA's failure and how to prevent the next terrorist attack. Um, and just completely missing the bulk of our questions. 
Uh, and and um, what you mentioned about the microbiologists, Michael Rupert did a lot of investigation on that, and he spoke recently in San Francisco. And we felt what was significant was that they were targeting the United States and trying really to criminalize dissent in this country. Who is? Oh, uh, with the attack on the World Trade Center yeah. and the Pentagon? Yeah. Look, let, let me just tell you, I mean, I've read most of that stuff, and I don't think it's credible. I really don't. Uh, I think it's very unlikely. That, I mean, part of it is going to be true. Like the connections between Cheney and those guys and the energy corporations, that's going to be a can of worms. But the idea that the CIA or US intelligence had anything to do with blowing up the World Trade Center, in my opinion, that's pretty outlandish. I've read Chasadovsky stuff and other things, and I really and don't Jared think- And Jared Israel? Yeah, and I don't, oh, Jared Israel stuff, in my opinion, is off the wall. I don't think it counts as evidence. I mean, you have to look at it and decide for yourself, but my own judgment is that that's very low credibility material. I mean, the internet is a very valuable instrument, but it's also a lethal weapon. Uh, you can put up anything you like. Uh, you don't need any evidence. Uh, you, uh, you can make allegations, uh, you can refer to this bit of data and that bit of data, and you really have to be very careful about what you see there. Uh, not that you don't have to be careful about what you see in, um, you know, foreign but, affairs, but, of but, course you do, but here even more so. But what about the government story? I mean, I think that's the most about preposterous. What? I mean, the, the government mainstream media uh, Interpretation how, of 9 how, I think it's exactly accurate. I mean, that's I think it was done by Al Qaeda, ridiculous. and it was a huge surprise, and it was a devastating blow to the United States. That part is accurate, I think. Oh, that's I disagree. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm not saying you should agree with me. If you think the that picture is credible, then by all means investigate it. But I just, if you're interested in my opinion, having looked at it, it seems to me of extremely low credibility. But, you know, that's a judgment call. You think it's important, by all means, look at it. <laughs> Incidentally, I should say that in the whole historical record that I've ever looked at, I've never seen anything remotely like that. Uh, maybe the only thing that even begins to come close is the Reichstag fire, which is a tiny thing in comparison. But if there's ever been anything like that, it's been you know, so deeply hidden, you don't find a trace of it. I don't think governments work like that, or could. And in this case, in my opinion, it would have been crazy if they'd done it. Anyhow, if you think it's interesting, by all means, investigate it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Professor Chomsky, uh, the name of the country that we are discussing today could have been X instead of the United States. Yeah. And the time that we are in today could have been year something instead of 2002. And when you look at the history, you see a lot of empires. And the powerful countries did not operate that differently than the United States operates today. No, but the impact of illusion. what's going on today is much more powerful because of globalization and the power of technology and because the economy is also much uh, global. Do you think there is any way, but throughout the history, power centers shifted. Do you think? Uh, Might shift again. However, nothing really changed in the nature of uh, humans and the new power pretty much operated the same way the previous one did. What do you think about global, globalization today, and do you think this attitude can change, well, or it, yes. it will be just the same thing? Well, first of all, I don't agree that nothing has changed. I mean, I think the world is way better than it was 40 years ago, and it's in, incomparably better than it was 100 years ago, and indescribably better than it was 200 years ago, in, a ma in all sorts of respects. Um, we don't live under kings and princes. We don't have, uh, we don't accept slavery. Uh, there's a degree of women's rights. Uh, you know, there's a degree of control over, uh, democratic control over what the governments do. Uh, you know, it's just a million things around that are, I mean, health has vastly improved. Uh, you know, pover poverty is terrible, but it's nothing like it what it was. Uh, there have been tremendous improvement. It hasn't come as a gift from above. It's come from popular struggles which are hard and difficult and committed, and it has achievements. We shouldn't overlook the achievements, which are extremely significant. 
uh, and, and they're just in our own recent lifetimes. They're very big. So it's, I don't agree that nothing's changed, but you're right in one respect. Power acts the same way it always did. It doesn't have the capacity it once had, but it still tries. Okay, so like after September 11th, immediately after September 11th, and incidentally, this was totally predictable. I mean, like the first interview I had after September 11th, they said what was trivially obvious, uh, that every harsh repressive force in the world is going to use this as an opportunity to pursue their own agendas more relentlessly. And they're going to do it in different ways depending on who they are. You know, like the US will do it one way and Turkey will do it another way and Russia will do it a different way. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Didn't take any particular brilliance to see that. Uh, so yeah, they're going to try to do what they can. And you're absolutely right, I made a couple of marginal allusions to this, uh, that when the, the way the U.S. acts now is not fundamentally different from the way, say, Britain acted, uh, you know, 100 years ago, uh, and France in its smaller domains and back as far as you can go in history. Uh, but uh, with those qualifications, let's turn to the main point, globalization. First of all, what is it, you know? I mean, globalization, uh, just, used neutrally, globalization just means international integration, okay? Everybody's in favor of it. I mean, it's been the core principle of the left and the working class movement since their origins. That's why every union is called an international, okay? Everybody's in favor of globalization. Now, the term has been appropriated by a narrow sector of power and privilege to refer to their version of international uh, integration, the investor rights version. And that makes sense for them to try to, buy, you know, to own the term because anyone who's opposed to their version then becomes anti-globalization, meaning some kind of primitive who wants to go back to the Stone Age or something like that. Uh, it's a bad error on the part of the critics of this investor rights uh, version of integration to accept the term anti-globalization. They should not. We're all in favor of globalization. The question is, is, is it going to be in the interest of people or in the interests of private power? But everybody's in favor of it, okay? Like nobody's opposed to the fact that you can call up your friend in Italy or something like that. That's integration. All right, now has, just using the term neutrally now, what, has it increased or has it decreased? Well, you know, in many respects, it's decreased. Uh, so if you look at international economic integration, uh, there are a lot of different measures. I mean, I mentioned one. There's a technical measure, which is convergence towards a single uh, price and wage, single market. Well, that's declining. Uh, during the period of the last 25 years, it's been declining. Furthermore, it's predicted to decline even further. Okay, so the investor rights version of globalization is predicted by its advocates to lead to less globalization in the technical sense. More globalization in their sense means they have control more of the wealth and power in the world. Uh, so that's one question. Take uh, what Adam Smith meant by it, okay? Uh, you're supposed to love Adam Smith. The core of free trade, according to Adam Smith, is what he called free circulation of labor meaning people can go wherever they want. If you don't have that, you can't begin to talk about free trade. Well, if we measure that, what's happened to globalization? Well, it turns out the peak period was about over a century ago. Uh, relative to population, the ability of people to move around uh, was higher then than it's ever been since. Not for pretty reasons, incidentally. I don't mean that the reasons were nice. Uh, the reasons were that people from who were fleeing the uh, horrors of the Industrial Revolution in Europe could come to the United States and massacre the population and take over their lands. Okay, like it wasn't a pretty reason, uh, but uh, the fact just in terms of uh, movement of people across borders is that it was higher then than it is now. I mean, that's why I'm, you know, my parents didn't end up in a gas chamber, okay, because there was a lot of uh, uh, globalization in the sense of movement across borders. That's declined. And if I, what has increased, on the other hand, other, by other measures, globalization has increased very fast, uh, like movement of capital. So increase of capital flow uh, across borders has just uh, increased, escalated astronomically in the last 25 years. 
uh, many international economists, uh, mainstream ones, um, can assume, uh, conclude that that's a substantial part of the reason why the international, why the performance of the international economy has been so poor in the last 25 years, and it has. By almost every macroeconomic measure, the performance of the economy is worse in the past 25 years than it was in the preceding 25 years, considerably. Uh, the period that's called globalization, the last 25 years, has seen a decline in just about everything. Uh, rate of growth, uh, rate of uh, investment, uh, even the rate of growth of trade has declined in the last 25 years. Uh, and a lot of economists attribute that to the increased financial volatility, the huge increase in capital flows across borders. In fact, this period of globalization, what's called globalization, past 25 years, it was really initiated by the breakdown of capital controls. Uh, the Bretton Woods system, the preceding 25 years, was based on control of capital movements. You know, the countries could control capital movements and currencies were regulated relative to one another within a pretty narrow band, which cut back speculation. And that was a period of huge growth. The period since has been much worse. Uh, so by that measure, freedom of movement of, say, speculative uh, uh, speculation on, against currencies, that kind of thing, capital flow across foreign exchange movement, uh, that's just escalated enormously. So by that measure, there's more globalization. Uh, you measure by people, less globalization. By capital movement, more globalization. In fact, there's very, you see it very dramatically in the U.S.-Mexico relation. So uh, the U.S.-Mexico border is, of course, an artificial border, like just about every border. It was established by conquest. Okay, U.S. conquered half of Mexico. That gives you the border. Uh, that's been a very porous border throughout history. People go up and back pretty freely in both directions for all kinds of reasons. Uh, it was militarized in 1994 under Clinton's uh, Operation Gatekeeper. Uh, that, it was militarized in order to stop the movement of people across the border. That is to cut back international integration. Why in 1994? Well, because that was the year when NAFTA was initiated. Uh, NAFTA is called, is claimed to be something that increases integration between Mexico and uh, uh, the United States, but not people. Uh, by, uh, measured by people, it cuts back the flow. That's why you had to militarize the border. Why did they want to militarize the border? Well, because what they predicted in Mexico is what's called an economic miracle from NAFTA, which means a disaster for most of the population. Uh, what was predicted was that the effect of NAFTA on Mexico would be a devastating blow to the majority of the population, which has indeed happened. Uh, wages have dropped precipitously, uh, hundreds of thousands of people driven off the land. Uh, investment has declined, though foreign investment has increased. Uh, and in general, it's been a kind of a economic miracle. Economic miracle means that for a small sector of wealthy people and for foreign investors, it's fantastic. Uh, that's the definition of a miracle. For most of the population, it's been uh, awful. And they expected that, and that's why you had to militarize the border. Uh, so did that increase integration or decrease it? Well, you know, that's an ideological question. Depends what you want to measure. When you militarize a border to prevent people from moving freely by Adam Smith's measure, it decreases it. Okay, by the measure of, uh, you know, the owners of the economy, it increases it. They make more profit. Uh, what about trade? You know, everybody reads that trade increased between Mexico and uh, the United States. Did it? Well, not by Adam Smith's measures. Uh, be, before NAFTA, you know, 1993, uh, there was plenty of so-called, there was plenty of movement of uh, commodities across the border. But about 50% of it was internal to a firm. Okay, that's not trade, okay, at least by classical economic measures. That's no more trade than if General Motors moved something from Indiana to Illinois, you know. If, you, if internal to a totalitarian institution, a command economy, you move something and it happens across a border, that's not trade in any meaningful sense. Well, it was 50% before NAFTA, now it's about 66%. Uh, so what about actual trade? You know, trade in some meaningful sense. 
Well, you know, nobody's measured it, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's declined. You know, we, we don't know that it's even grown, uh, even as fast as it was growing before. Uh, and intra-firm tra transfers are only a small part of centrally managed interactions. There's also what are called strategic alliances, you know, like IBM and Toshiba make some deal. Uh, or there's what's called outsourcing, uh, when a corporation uh, uses some small non-unionized uh, outfit somewhere to make things very cheaply and they don't have to worry about wages and benefits, but they control it. And if it happens to cross borders, that's still centrally managed. Well, there haven't been any really careful analyses that I'm aware of, but the few studies that have been done, one by, I think, Brookings Institution, estimated that around 70% of cross-border interactions are uh, probably centrally managed in one fashion or another, you know, intra-firm or strategic alliances or, uh, you know, outsourcing or other devices. Actually, you could only get answers to this, one, if anybody studied it, and nobody studies it, uh, and two, if you could get into the, it's the old question, the former question, if you could get into the internal workings of the totalitarian institutions that are running it, the command economies that are running it. But these estimates are probably in somewhere in the right ballpark, uh, which means that very little of what's going on across borders is trade in any serious sense. Uh, some things are, have definitely declined, like movement of people. Uh, in the case of NAFTA, not just by accident, by militarizing the border. Just a day or two ago, uh, Bush announced further militarization of the border. Uh, that's cutting back international integration. I mean, pretext is drugs, but you know, that's pretext for anything. Uh, the, uh, uh, so you just can't answer these questions simply about globalization. There's just too many different ways of looking at it. Uh, if you look at it from the point of view of people's interests, it looks very different than if you look at it from the point of view of uh, investors' interests. Just totally different. Uh, will there be a change over the future? Well, you know, that's, nobody can predict human affairs at all. Too much depends on what people like you decide to do. It's a question of will and choice. That's why predictions of human affairs are so ridiculous. Uh, but there are some tendencies. So if you go back to, say, 1950, uh, the U.S. had about half of the world's, controlled about half the world's economy and wealth, <coughs> roughly 50 percent. If you go to 19, say, say 1970, it was down to about 25 percent. Uh, what had happened was recovery of uh, the other major industrial centers uh, from the effects of the war and decolonization and a bunch of other things. And by around 1970, economically speaking, uh, the world was what's called tripolar, like three major economic centers, more or less on a par. Uh, one is U.S.-based North America, uh, the other is German-based Europe, and the third is Japan-based Asia. Uh, by now, it's more complicated, so like Japan and China and you know, Germany and France and a little more diverse, but basically have the same three centers. They're kind of comparable, roughly speaking. You look at resources, um, industrial capacity, um, so on, uh, you know, uh, financial reserves, actually, in that, by that measure, Asia is actually ahead. Uh, they're kind of on a par. So you have three major economic poles in the world. You got one military force. In military terms, the U.S. is overwhelmingly dominant, but that's the only respect the only major respect. Uh, where is that going to go? Well, you know, that's pretty hard to predict. I mean, it could, remember, you go back to, say, the 18th century, the global centers of economic life were Asia. I mean, Ch China and India were the major commercial and industrial powers. Uh, Europe was kind of a backwater. Uh, that changed for, you know, not, again, not pretty reasons over the next couple of centuries, uh, but it could go back that way. Uh, there is interesting scholarly work that suggests it might go back that way. Uh, we don't know. Uh, so I don't really think you can predict things like that. And just one, quickly one more question. On language, globalizational language, what do you think, if you get a well, chance, you if know, you could just... Right, I mean, first of all, uh, let me just say, as you know, it says linguist on my door, but, as the, but that tells you nothing about this. Uh, English is the international language for a very simple system, a reason. Uh, the English and their offshoots, namely us, conquered the world. 
okay? They had, we had, the English-speaking people had way more guns and much more savagery than anybody else, so English is the international language. If somebody else gets the guns and, you know, develops a comparable culture of savagery, something else will be the international language. <laughs> it's not a linguistic question, you know. Thanks. I want to take just a moment to acknowledge our many volunteers who helped make this evening possible. And when our, our volunteers put in a substantial amount of time, they get a, a t-shirt from the Peace and Justice Center. I think Noam Chomsky just qualified for his t-shirt. Let me give you a...